Go. Hi, and welcome to the second day of the Pint of Science 2021, coming to you live from Stavanger, Norway. My name is Alexander Rothkopf. I'm a physicist here at the University of Stavanger, and I'll be your host for this evening. Thank you for tuning in. Our program this evening is Doggy Dog, and we have four great speakers from the University of Stavanger waiting for you. And uh, during the presentations, whenever you have a question or comment, make sure to leave it in the live chat right next to this YouTube video. We will collect all of your input and then sit down with our speakers and uh, get to answer all of, all of them for you. Okay, and uh, I think we can start the evening. Let me switch positions quickly before introducing our speakers. First up, we have Tom Brökel. Uh, Tom is an award-winning professor here at the University of uh, Stavanger. Uh, and he's an adjunct professor at the Center for Region and Innovation Studies at the University of uh, Bremen in Germany. Uh, hey, hey, Alex. Uh, Tom received his PhD in uh, 2008 from the University of uh, Jena in economics. Uh, and he went on to work at the Max Planck Institute for Economics in Germany, the University of uh, Hannover, and the University of uh, Utrecht in the, in the Netherlands before joining us here at UIS in 2019. Um, hi, Tom. Hi. Uh, next up, we have uh, Sid Serene. Uh, Sid is an award-winning associate professor here at the uh, University of uh, Stavanger. Sid uh, got his PhD in development studies in 2016, uh, from actually jointly from the University of Copenhagen and the University of uh, Padova, in a prestigious Erasmus Mundus double degree program. Afterwards, Sid uh, worked at the uh, University of uh, Erlangen in Germany, uh, at the University of Washington in the United States, and uh, at the University of Bergen, uh, before joining us here at UIS in uh, 2020. And uh, Sid is a member of the prestigious Young Academy of Norway. Hi, Sid. Hey. Next, hey. Uh, next up, uh, Mats Sulheim. Um, Marta is an associate professor here at uh, the University of uh, Stavanger and she's heading the Stavanger Center for Innovation Research. Uh, Marta got her um, PhD in 2017 from, uh, in uh, diversity and regional innovation uh, from the University of Stavanger and uh, she worked as a postdoctoral research associate uh, until 2019 when she joined UIS as a staff member. Also Marta is a member of the prestigious Young Academy of Norway. Hi, Marta. Hi, good to be here. Great. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we welcome uh, Rune Tottenhambu. Uh, Rune is a professor of leadership here at the Uni University of uh, Stavanger. Rune actually got his master's in 2004 from the University of Wolverhampton in the UK and became a lecturer afterwards at uh, Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, uh, transitioning to become a professor at the University of Staffordshire after that. And it's from this university that he also obtained his PhD in 2019. Um, Rune held a uh, adjunct professor position for some time at UIS before he then eventually joined us as a full professor here at UIS in 2019. And uh, Rune is actually also an entrepreneur having co-founded his uh, leadership consultancy company, Firesoul. Great to have you. Thank you. Our program tonight is uh, actually sponsored by the Young Academy of Norway. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity to ask uh, Marte and Sid to tell you guys what the uh, Academy is actually all about. Please. Sure, thanks. So the Young Academy of Norway, or uh, Academia Fongra Forskere, which explains our acronym, IF, as we call it. Um, uh, we're a bunch of people, Marta will tell you how many, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're interdisciplinary, we're uh, quite diverse in terms of uh, who we are as people, really fun to hang out with, so that's a common thread. And uh, we're also based all over Norway, coming from multiple career trajectories, a bit like our group here tonight. We've had a bit of uh, this and that and bounced around, and, uh, and the idea is to be a research policy forum. It's, uh, it's also a place where we really push for engagement and making sure that there's a voice taking forward the concerns of researchers uh, within Norwegian academia. 
So it's it's a really fun group to be part of, and <laughs> <laughs> that is really excellent. Thank you so much. We are forty four members at the moment, but we are currently rec recruiting. So you can just log on to our website, and you can find all the information there. And we're looking forward to maybe having one of you guys watching now, or guys or girls watching, joining us. So great. So I I hope. That uh, through this show you will recruit a bunch of uh, new members. Uh, let's let's hope for the best. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, we can actually start uh, the main program, Doggy Dog. And I will just hand over uh, to Tom here uh, to my uh, right. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, the the talk I'm going to give is uh, entitled "Smoking Empty: Try Another Innovation and Growth." And it's something um, I put up as a challenge. To recognize where the smoking gun actually comes in, so where this all uh, relates to each other. So, the general idea is um, of this presentation or of this talk is that if you think a little bit about the history of mankind, you will have noticed that um, there has been tremendous economic growth, and this is something I think we all agree. And we all, fortunately, uh, that's one of the um, the good things. If you're late, uh, if, you're, if you're born relatively late, you can enjoy much of this growth. Right? And just to give some numbers, and therefore I have this wonderful device here that gives me <laughs> access to all these numbers, because they are just astonishing. So if you go back to 1500, the time that I would say none of us can really recall, um, there was before the stock market. There was, I'm not sure when it was actually founded in the Netherlands, but, but probably, right? Let's assume probably before that. The world GDP, so that's a kind of measure for economic output and services and, and products uh, that are, are created in a year was 430 billion dollars adjusted for uh, purchasing power and so on and so forth. So 430 billion, which is already quite a number, right? Um, but if you go to um, 2014, this has actually grown to about 104 trillion US dollars. So this is, um, if, you, if you have time at home, for instance, write down all the zeros that we have added to that, but fortunately on the right-hand side, not on the left-hand side. And if you look at even at uh, the citizen number, so uh, sorry, the per capita income, this has grown also from uh, in 1500 uh, of about $1,700 per, uh, per year as a UK citizen to more than $35,000 in 2014. And for number for Norway, this number is even bigger, but there are some interesting effects about that. So anyway, so there has been tremendous economic growth. And if I would ask, those of you here in the in the audience who know or who have studied partly these phenomena as well, then of course there are quite a number of reasons for why we have achieved such a tremendous economic growth. And one of the most important one is that we have been extremely innovative. So mankind has come up with lots and lots of uh, new innovations that allowed us to become more innovative. The steam engine, uh, ICT, and so on, and you name it. ICT, ICT, information communication technology. Uh, nice check there. <laughs> so uh, we, we have all this uh, um, innovation that have allowed us to actually become more productive in economic terms, meaning we're able to produce per working hour more services, more goods that most of us appreciate, right? And we're still pretty good in that. So just as, I mean, there's no precise figure, but somebody, not me, has made an estimate saying that per year we're adding about 30,000 products, new products. So to our existing portfolio of products, we add about 30,000. I don't know, it didn't count it. Let's, let's trust this number. And um, another figure that shows a little bit how innovative we are. So in my type of research, we quite usually refer to patents as another measure of innovation. We can discuss about that. But this number also grew from uh, 1975 or from the year 1975 of 70,000 in the US per year to more than 500,000 per year. So just another indication of what has going on. And we know there are a lot of very, very fascinating uh, innovations amongst these, electrical cars to name a few, renewable energies, uh, just recently colorful um, computers were introduced, and even in Norway, Citron Boller. I don't know whether you've seen those <laughs> lemon buns, uh, which are new, I didn't see them before, so that's great. Um, and it, not only new products were added, but also each of these products has somehow become more, uh, has added more features, uh, more features have been added to them. So just think about the smartphone. Most of us are old enough to remember the time before the smartphone, right? Um, and if we, if we see in our hats the evolution of the smartphone, I mean, in the beginning, you could actually do calls. 
This is something we hardly do anymore, right? But um, we just have a wonderful timeline here uh, with type of functionality has been added, SMS and digital audio player, emails, wireless uh, LAN, multimedia player, health monitor, um, e-books, TV, and so on and so forth. So this, the product even has added more features, which also gives credit to our innovation. And this innovation is still on the rise. So if we combine now these two aspects, we have seen this tremendous growth in the past. We know parts of this or large parts of this relate to, um, to innovation activities. And we are nowadays more innovative than ever. Of course, we have this increasing number of products, new patents, many more patents. Then we kind of would assume that actually um, we should be, from an economic point of view, grow quicker than ever or faster than ever. And here comes the interesting point. We are not. So interestingly enough, although we are pumping out uh, new innovations in a record basis these days, economic growth has somehow not kept up with that. So um, maybe it is because um, some of these products don't really give value added, right? Citron dollar, um, <laughs> you can debate about that. It's probably a matter of taste. Uh, I recently switched to a new email client, um, which now has a smart invoice. If I didn't know that I needed that. I'm not sure whether it's really helpful, but I do have it now. So that's that's really great. So, but if we come back to this economic growth, uh, we see, for instance, as, as one measure, I have multiple here, I'm not going through all of them, um, but one is really astonishing. If you look at the productivity, labor productivity per hour, that is basically how many goods and services you can produce per hour as a, as a worker. We had growth of these uh, from year to year of about 10 to 15 percent about 30 years ago. Nowadays, we're down to two or three percent in all countries in the world, basically. Some outliers, but still on average, economic growth rates have decreased. So the big question, and this is also I try to tackle with my research, is what is going on there? Record number of innovation, poor economic growth, although we know that innovation are a driver of economic growth. And one thing that may be an explanation we are trying to explore is we do something else. We're not only creating a massive amount of innovation, uh, larger than ever before, we're also investing more than ever before in R&D. So another figure here, uh, in the year 2000 worldwide, there were about um, 676 billion US dollar invested in R&D. That's like more than the whole world had 500 years ago, you said. Uh, absolutely. And Today, or 2018, this number has grown to uh, <laughs> 2 trillion US dollars, right? Which is it's, it's massive. Um, I wish I could show you these wonderful plots, but <laughs> I don't. <laughs> but maybe as a, as a, as a number, as another number. Um, so for instance, Apple alone is investing more than uh, 12 billion US dollars per year just in R&D these days. Uh, that's more than the revenue a couple of years ago. So that's just um, incredible. And Another example that, that gives an insight into what might have happened is many of you probably know Moore's law, right? Uh, that's basically this idea of Indian ICT industry that with each year we are able to double the number of transistors on a computer, uh, on a computer chip. Bluntly speaking, it doubles its speed uh, by year, uh, from year to year. And this uh, law has been um, in place now for almost uh, 30 to 40 years, and um, it's still valid today. So each year, computers, let's say, roughly speaking, become twice as fast. <laughs> what this does not show is, however, that the number of R&D staff that is necessary to sustain this number has grown 18 times since 1970. So apparently, we are also investing much more in innovation, but we also seem to be, or it seems to be necessary that we invest so much more in innovation in order to keep this rate of increasing numbers of innovation or even stable numbers of innovation up, which gives us at least some growth, right? So this is the type of paradox I, I really would like to explore and I'm currently exploring and I would like to put up as a kind of debate. Before I do that, there's one more figure I want to put up. In case you don't believe me that maybe something has happened in this world and this um, what might has happened um, we call complexity that is our world has become more complex but also innovations have become more complex and maybe it is this reason because now to create an innovation today it is not enough to simply come up with a new idea it usually has to be much more this idea is usually much more complex than what has been in the past an example 
is um, some of you may know Lego, right? So if you look at the number, the average number of pieces in the Lego set, which you bought in 1950, there were about 20 Lego pieces in there. This number has grown to about 300. The average Lego set nowadays has 300. So even our child I mean, architecture children, one is about 1,500. Yeah, I didn't look for white. the maximum. I didn't look for the maximum, <laughs> but just on average. And this you can see in, in other things as well. The Tesla S, um, the, the electrical car, has more than 30,000 parts in it. Right? This is, this is quite a lot. The Boeing 747 has more than 6 million pieces. Um, if you look at, uh, for instance, the engine control software in 1981 that was built into a GM, so the, the most advanced software uh, in GM, uh, had about nine, uh, 50, sorry, 50,000 lines of code, um, which is already quite a lot. The space shuttle in 1980 um, had about 400,000 lines of code um, steering it, starting it, and also on and so on. But if we look, for instance, today at the computer operation system, um, there we are at about 80 million lines of code that underlie it. And if you look about uh, the car software, the software in an electrical car, so all this, uh, what's going on there, us uh, controlling that, then we're talking about more than 100 million lines of code, right? And this shows quite nicely how, how the innovations we are creating, the new products we're adding, the new processes we're inventing, all seem to have become more complex. And this in turn seems to drive also R&D costs up. We need to invest more people, more resources into R&D, which apparently implies that we can't spend these resources on something else, consumption or uh, investments, other type of investments, and we're losing out on economic growth. But this is just a hypothesis. So this is something we're trying to test out, whether the increase in complexity of innovation activities, of products, of our economic system actually reduces the economic growth we can achieve um, in the future um, as well as today. So the big question is how do we go from here? And um, I would say either we are kind of trapped in a complexity <laughs> trap, that is this increase in complexity prevents us from achieving the growth rates in economic, uh, in economic terms that we have in the past. Um, we need to sustain these ever-increasing R&D investments just to sustain the type of growth rates that we had in the past or not even reaching them anymore. But maybe we also have to reduce our growth aspirations. So maybe we can't simply grow by 10% uh, per year, uh, but we have to look at uh, lower growth rates. Maybe we also see another revolution going on in science, right? So things like AI, big data may actually help people like us, like, like scientists, to become more productive and come up with new innovations on a higher rate. Or maybe all this is just a measurement error. Because maybe inventions like video streaming, like we use today, what is the value there? How does this translate into economic value? Right? Maybe we're not capturing that and we actually still grow tremendously from an economic point of view, but just our measurements are not fully there. So maybe we're not able to measure all these new shiny things that we are inventing. And with that, I would really <laughs> like to hand over to Sam. We'll talk about shiny toys. What did all of this have to do with smoking? Well, that's... that's <laughs> Yeah, I said, well, <laughs> throughout my, my talk, I tried to come up with where this is actually, no, of course, there, there is this, our R&D gun is smoking. So we're pumping out innovations we're, uh, on, on, on basis of R&D investments, we're investing a lot. So the innovation gun is smoking hot, but maybe it's coming out empty in terms of innovation that create additional economic growth. Cool. I am prepared. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. And, and is it Tony or Joni Mitchell? I think it's your present uh, time for your presentation. All right. All right. Well, well, as you might have cottoned on, some of you true fans out there, uh, the, the theme of Dog Eat Dog, which is a Joni Mitchell album, um, is reflected in each of our talks, right? And, and mine is uh, going to take us driving straight into shiny toys. And, um, and I'm going to, Tom's a deep guy. I'm going to start at about half as deep as Tom, about 40%. Um, which is a pretty good growth rate, but uh, <laughs> but I'm going to start at um, at about the time that this film I saw yesterday was set at in 18, 
20, so about 200 years ago. Um, 1820 is when the, the film is called First Cow. Great reviews, go see it. Um, it's, it's set in Oregon, right? Kind of gold rush times. And the reason it's called First Cow, I won't give away anything else, but there's a cow in it. That's the first cow in Oregon. And this guy gets it over and like, there's a bit of milking involved. And <laughs> but but you, here's a related question. You know what else changed around then in 1817? A revolution that, you know, or uh, an innovation that changed the world. And actually Martha got here thanks to that innovation today. Bicycle. Yeah, that's right. 1817, Martha. In Mannheim? Probably. There you go. Uh, but I must say that you got uh, you said Erlangen. It was Erfurt. But oh, now, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Yeah, my, yeah. my bad there. No, my bad. No, but the closest that Thuringia comes to having a city. <laughs> but uh, but maybe in Mannheim. Um, so um, so in 1817 we got the bicycle. Does anybody know when we got electricity? In terms of what? Well, okay. Let's say the Chicago World's Fair. We know that this happened. 1896. There you go, yeah. So towards the end of the 19th century, we're getting to, you know, there's another, just on the topic of films, there's one called The Current Wars, Benedict Cumberbatch, really good film. I watched that one. 1880. I knew the name. There you go. <laughs> Not from the book. Maybe we should go out to watch films together. And this could be fun. Just thank you, Netflix. So, so the, the Current Wars, it's, you know, the battle between S. Edison and uh, Westinghouse and Tesla. Tesla's the immigrant who gets kind of taken advantage of for a while, but he's actually... He got it right, as we know, um, with DC and AC and all of these current-related uh, things. But we have electricity and uh, and alternating current lights of cities. And uh, um, then at the start of the 20th century, we have... Uh, it didn't really look like this. You know, it, is, it, yeah, it was a lot bulkier and uh, it and moved that. quite slowly. And uh, there's also a really good book uh, about Alexander von Humboldt and... Uh, uh, Kant and, and 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 one of the things and I'm not going to tell you more about that book. Lots of diversions here. But what it what what it does remind me of that book is that traveling was bloody hard. It used to the the word come the root word is travail, which is like suffering, and and so when cars started in the 20th century, they really revolutionized a lot of things. Um, coming back to the innovation topic that you brought up. I think in some ways we it might not be reflected in economic growth, but we're probably better off than the very well off, very fancy people as recently as a hundred years ago. Because you couldn't get somewhere as far as the distance we routinely go for like a weekend or something without your back hurting and you know, lots of trouble and you had to be you had to be pretty privileged. Now you can sort of just do it and you can even complain that I can't take my dog on Schustbussen because they don't allow that because of people with allergies and this sort of, this level of uh, complaint, right? And that's something that should, should change, of course, since they run many buses a day from uh, Stavanger to Bergen. Um, but, but staying on topic, um, uh, the, the car came to Norway in, uh, in the early 1900s, around 1920. It, a lot of people, uh, well, rich people at the time, uh, who had cars, so it wasn't a lot, it was a few hundred. They also killed uh, a couple hundred uh, people, mostly children. Um, so that wasn't very popular. 2,000 cars, they killed 200 people. Everybody driving around, you know, like was more likely than not to have uh, to be a murderer. Um, uh, and and um, and and it changed how our cities in Norway are. So um, in the 1950s and 60s, at that point, there were enough cars around that they had turned our cities into these smoky places, loud noises. You can't get away. And the king became a member of the Norsk Automobil uh, for uh, for Bund, or for anything enough, and uh, they even have the royal insignia as part of the logo. And um, and the suburban dream came to Norway, imported from the U.S. And Stavanger, our city, is you know also like the blueprint comes from planners in Houston and this idea of the great sprawl. Um, and and so the car, it was a project of enrollment, which went from we love our city, we love our spaces. There's great photos of Peter's Garden and Savang from 100 years ago. There's buses parked there. And like I said, it wasn't like, you know, they weren't very fancy, but that's that's what it used to be. The 50s, 60s, we changed to a different urban form. And these shiny toys, they turn our cities into the dream of the detached house, this idea that we all live with our little garden. I spent a little time around Eigenestocker, and even though there was a very nice park there, you could string up a hammock and line it, 
everybody's kids had the trampoline in their garden and nobody stepped out of their house to see other people unless they walked the dog, um, unless they were in their car. So it really changed. The shiny toy changed us. And that's not incidental. Joni Mitchell tells us this. She tells us this in her song lyrics. She talks about, uh, about this sort of, uh, you know, our obsession with modernity and, and, and things like economic growth, um, which, which have their purposes. But, but what, why, why I'm saying all of this is that today we have a very we stand at an interesting juncture where we have the chance to go through another sort of revolution in mobility and in our cities. There's multiple things coming together. One of them is the urban form itself. There's a big push towards compactness and compact living, which means getting along with people, but maybe that's not such a bad thing. I mean, it's all people that love to go out, get pints with. And, uh, and the other thing is, it's, it's about moving away from the idea of cars as necessarily being the same as an individual ownership model, the same as something that you have to park right where you are. Cars could be something that could be electric, as they are. We're one of the leading countries in the world when it comes to embracing electric cars, right? So they're cleaner than, uh, than fossil fuel cars. Um, they could be something that's shared, and we have a lot of uh, initiatives, Nabo Wheel, Wheel Delivering, and different models for how you access a car. You don't actually have to own it. Um, and, and at the same time, we have other innovations that are sprouting up all around us. One that's been quite controversial is these micro-mobility solutions, El Sparkasukla or electric scooters. They're, you know, all around. You can get a subscription. You can get different subscription models. There's multiple companies. They're bringing it down to a competitive market. And, and at the same time, we have electric bikes. One of the companies in town uh, tries to pitch them as they're awesome and they feed the sukla. So it's making the cycle sexy again. It's making it, this is something you want. This is something you can get onto and you don't have to sweat and you know, it'll be fine. And it's, it's a cool thing. Um, and, and, and all of these things are powered by several kinds of agendas. One of those is digitalization, bringing back to shiny toys where we want things that we can kind of access online. We want things that we can, you know, I want, I want a shared car, but can I get it for that holiday weekend? Well, I'm going to check if it's available and book it now. I want to get that electric scooter because I'm in a hurry and I can't be bothered to wait for the bus. Well, okay, let's see if I have that and let me get that other app. It's a different, so we're on all these platforms. Now we have a, a few years ago, this, this happened in Denmark and in Sweden. They launched these great ads for this amazing form of futuristic mobility that was connected, like you could see it kind of online where it is location-wise. Um, it was shared, you know, this incredible innovation that's happening right now. And it was something that you didn't have to bother finding parking for, you didn't have to pay for it and so on. It was just based, it was mobility as a service. And this thing came out of the tunnel and you were holding your breath, great ad campaign. And it was a bus and it was electric. And in you know countries like China, the got cities that have 95% of their bus fleet completely electrified. We had two in Stavanger in 2015. I, I hear it like went up by 150%, amazing growth rate in 2017. And then we stopped. I think Bergen and Oslo, they've got 100 odd now. They've just come in, all mostly from China as well. Where are we on, on thinking about our digitalization, our mobility transitions, our urban form? Are we thinking in terms of what we need in order to make our city great to get around in, to make it attractive for people to live without dependence on a car, without paying probably 3,000 kroner a month out of pocket for all the things that come associated with it? I mean, that's good money to go out and have a nice time with friends or to do something nice with your family. Um, or are we are we kind of in this um, in this sort of obsession with innovation where we want more and more lines of code. I mean, we have the autonomous bus uh, going around uh, my neighborhood in uh, Storhaug and, and it also goes around Olgo, which, you know, is also known as uh, the, the, the town that's the home of Norwegian outlet. And it's really fun if you go there and check out, uh, the, the mayor actually cut a cake saying that Olgo had beaten Stavanger to being a smart city by having the autonomous bus there. It's great because it's got a really nice, the best bus stop I've seen right there where this bus trundles along at 20 kilometers an hour on its own. And it's got a car parking lot full of hundreds of cars with everybody who drove over to consume at Norwegian outlet at good mm -hmm. prices, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the society that we live in. And that is the, the obsession with shiny toys. 
I tell you, Joni Mitchell's onto something there. She was that song is about digitalization, it's about electric mobility, and it's about our failure to understand what is really valuable in life. So just to close, the things that we could do with our shiny toys, like our buses that actually Stavanger does have with, the, with Columbus, you can see them on the map. The things we could do is make them go not up to Sola, just past the airport, but a couple of kilometers more to the beaches. We have some of the best beaches in the country. They're fantastic. I see people not with electric scooters, but with, you know, the little, the little manual scooters that kids have to push. See them taking a half hour walk for the last two kilometers. It takes the bus about 90 seconds. But we don't do that. Why not? Why not? I lived in Brighton. They gave two for one offers on the weekends. They ran buses down the South Downs. We have at least as beautiful landscapes here. That to me would be adding value. It would probably be reflected in economic growth or at least in human well-being. That would make it easier for people. If we go out to our cabins. Why don't we have a scheme where you don't have to pay a lot for a taxi if you get there by bus? Why don't we have buses running to Sirda all the time? And then have a scheme where everybody who takes the bus there gets a fixed price on a cab in town. Could even be autonomous, I don't mind, that takes them to their cabin. So that we can make it attractive. Now that would be something that would be really innovative. That would be something that digitalization could enable. And that's something that we need to put our money behind instead of subsidies for the next Tesla, instead of giving all inclusive packages to everybody who buys a car. Because last I checked, there's a lot of people who didn't own a car, some who don't want to, some who can't afford to. And the future of our cities, which have space at a premium, which are trying to become more compact, that future does not lie in taking up a lot of space with parking with something that doesn't get used 90 odd percent of the time. It lies with shared mobility, it lies with getting to know each other, having a good time, being able to get a couple of drinks and get home without having to drive, right? And uh, that's really uh, that's really all I wanted to say for now. <laughs> yeah. But but talking of that, you have a Johnny Mitchell song you really like. Yes, um, I've listened to it over and over again. I, I really love it. It's called Good Friends. And uh, it's tapping into a little bit of what you were talking about uh, today, actually. Uh, because around 10 years ago, I was uh, working in the maritime industry, in the maritime cluster, and I was working with communication. And I, I realized that when I was working there, there was a lot of international workers, there was a lot of foreign-born workers working in that industry. And I, I thought, okay, this is something that I would like to investigate uh, a bit further. This was just before the financial crisis, and I thought, okay, I can go in and, and maybe do a master's degree at the same time as I'm working here because, you know, I, I saw this was not really going my way in terms of uh, having a permanent position, maybe doing some extra, um, uh, getting this master's degree would be good. So I was able to do that together with uh, Mörforskning, this um, research center. And I wanted to look at foreign-born workers in the maritime cluster. And I wanted to ask them two questions, and that's where it taps into a little bit of what you were mentioning here. Because the two questions that I asked them was, the first one was, how do these highly skilled foreign-born workers perceive the places that they are coming into? And I was looking into seven different municipalities on the western coast of Norway, so it's not a big city. You know, some we had Ålesund was one of the, the largest. But it was these seven municipalities, it was over 100 companies, and I wanted to see how do they perceive the places that they come into? Like what kind of activities do they get engaged with? Um, what hobbies do they have? Who do, who do they interact with? And then the second question that I wanted to ask was, what is their role when it comes to innovation? And that question, the role when it comes to innovation was related to uh, diversity research, how diversity is, basically a difference on any attribute that makes you believe that that person is different from self. And that difference is, as Jody Mitchell also says in that song, gets like a big particle in your eye or something. Look it up, look up the lyrics yourself. It's hard to remember. <laughs> you practice so much. Before, <laughs> I practice right? so much. It gets like, that, that, that difference gets like a, a big difference in our eyes. A, a small particle gets like a big difference in your eyes. I think it's, that's the way it goes. So, but those differences and that diversity can also affect how you're being treated in the workplace. And this is sort of a little bit of the, of the background of this diversity and how they, these foreign-born workers were bringing in this diversity to the company and they could also take part in this innovation process, but maybe not because this difference 
could actually affect how they were being treated in the workplace. And that also speaks to, like more broadly in, in diversity research, it speaks about primary diversity characteristics and secondary diversity characteristics. So the first one, primary diversity characteristics, speaks of things that you cannot change, such as I'm born in, in Darlene, so I cannot change that. But then you have secondary diversity characteristics, which is education, experience, etc. And these interact, of course. So you can be foreign born, but you're an engineer and you have your occupation. And all of these aspects also feed into what could potentially be your role in innovation processes. So Tom also mentioned, he talked about um, innovation, but what is it really? In many ways you could say, okay, it's R&D that you put into it, but it's also about innovation being a social process where people come together and they meet and they interact. They have different competencies and they, they come in, they can have primary or, or secondary diversity characteristics and they come together and they try to solve something and come up with something new because innovation is something that is new, it's useful and it's implemented. So that is distinguishes also from being just an in invention. It is a shiny toy. It is something that is put onto the market. It's implemented. So then it's also something that we also know, and this is uh, from a large uh, amount of research from diversity and looking how diversity could, could affect innovation process. We know that diversity affects innovation because it all, innovation often takes place when you have this going out of the, the silos, when you have this boundary expanding where diverse knowledge intersect. So that was sort of stemming those, those sort of um, actions from diversity, innovation. That was why I asked the second question. Could these foreign born workers affect, what could their role be in innovative processes? So these two questions, I thought at the beginning that these are sort of completely different. You have one, how do these foreign born uh, workers perceive the places where they move into? And what is their role in innovative processes? These are two different questions. Or are they? Maybe not. Because you talked about they were driving in their cars, right? And and that they were not in, interacting and how these how that city could be shaped like that could also affect who you meet, right? And that is precisely what we found here is that the highly skilled foreign born workers, they were headhunted to come to these positions. They saw that the social ties and who they were interacting with in these places permeated the organizations. So these social ties that were formed there affected the role that they were given within the organization. And maybe this could be slightly because these are smaller places, some of this, and they could be more uh, visible if your last name is this and that you know, okay, you come from that and that part in that that little village and, and you know, you, that could be more visible in smaller places. But still, this is something that was really interesting because they, they identified that there were several places where they could contribute to the innovation process, but they were not allowed into those rooms. They were not accepted into uh, to those rooms. And I can give you some concrete examples. Some of it was, for example, when it came to um, helping with uh, facilitating launching goods and services into their homelands, setting up contracts with people in their homelands. And they're like, why don't they use my competence? I speak the language, I have um, knowledge of uh, some of the culture aspects, or it could be different aspects, that, or, or have pro different social or professional networks that could be fruitful here. Why do they not use my knowledge and competence? Some of them pointed to it that it was uh, maybe they don't know and now we know there's a lot of things going on with with the uh, big data people analytics how we can look at networks within our organization who is who is uh, interacting with whom and also it can be about recruitment how do we recruit and how do we retain how do people feel that they belong how do they feel included in the workplace so now we know that there's a lot of these uh, tools that we could use uh, further on but that was sort of my starting point also looking into these mechanisms and seeing okay do we see that that's, that um, these foreign-born workers can affect innovation and based on this sort of diversity they can bring a new perspective not only that they can bring in new perspectives but it could also be because they can challenge the force assumptions that rests in organizations and that also comes more from human resource management you have this similarity attraction perspective where we know that we prefer to engage with people that we perceive to be similar to ourselves right and that brings back to the diversity definition that i said in the uh, earlier that it's 
any difference on any attribute that made you make you believe that that person is different from self so you prefer to engage with people that are similar to yourself or that you perceive to be similar to yourself it's easier communication flows a lot better you think it's you know it's less friction it's nice but then on the other hand, you have this cognitive resource diversity perspective that is sort of, these are ideal types, of course, and you know, they could be differences, but that they are pushing against one another because you know, in this cognitive resource diversity perspective, there's a lot of gains of putting diversity into various parts of the innovation process. It could be in the beginning when you have these creative phases, brainstorming, etc. or it could be also when it comes to actual implementation of innovation to different markets. So you have this similarity attraction, which also, and, and this cognitive resource diversity perspective, this really feeds also into what we see from social identity theory and social psychology, talking about these in and out groups, talking about us versus them. And you have this in group where we know also that you, um, you prefer to engage with people that you think are similar to yourself, you trust them more, you retain more positive information about them, and you also help them more. There are numerous experiments demonstrating this, for example, from the parking lot, where they're setting up an experiment and you could see a, a stranger pretending because he's pretending it, it, this is an experiment but he is there as an actor asking someone else for um for money because he needs some coins this was in the maybe in old experiments <laughs> but now you could use it in your user phone but he was actually he was asking for coins to put on uh, into the um, into the parking uh, machine and we could actually see that there was a higher propensity for people to help him if they perceive if they looked the same or if he was dressed in a certain way and there's also other ex real life examples of this after hurricane katrina you could see who was helped first was also related to the identification of the people in the in the um, emergency intervention the, the people in the, in the front line you could also see that in numerous experiments also from based on um, on football fans how uh, or students identified as football fans walking across from location A to location B on campus, and they saw a guy uh, lying on the um, uh, on the ground, and he was holding on to his foot. And you could ex the the researchers could observe whether or not this group of students were helping him or not, and they saw that these students that were identified as Manchester United supports uh, supporters, in fact, they were going to see a match. That was why they were crossing campus. They were more likely to help that person laying down if he was wearing a Manchester United uh, t-shirt than when he, if he was wearing a, a Liverpool t-shirt. And numerous of these examples I could mention. Anyway, so bring it more to uh, to a little bit of a close. I mean, that was um, the, my starting point of also why I decided, okay, I will leave the marath leave the marathon cluster. I would go in uh, to research and, and try to look more into these in details. So a lot of my research have, have looked at the linkages between primary, secondary diversity characteristics and see how that affects various types of, of innovation differently, but also how context and these contexts where these firms are placed have also um, affected those relationships. But what I think also is important to mention here, and that was sort of, is that it's not an automatic relationship between diversity and innovation. It's not so you can think, okay, well, just hire a bunch of diverse people and have these these diverse group and you know a lot of innovation will come out of it uh, you have to think about it you have to create creative and constructive dynamics in and between groups that allow this this diversity to be utilized and leverage the potential that you could have and I'm, I'm very cognizant also of the time constraints here but I just wanted to mention a few things and that is one of them is curiosity it's curiosity to get to know people that are different from yourself it's about also empathy and perspective taken being able to take the perspectives of people that might have different opinions about your about than you than you do it's about making friends you can think about who who is in your friend base do you have diverse friends or do you sort of always hang out with um, the same group of people in like a midnight suit that is Joni Mitchell's words not mine and then it's about thinking um, it's about psychological safety it's about are you feeling free to say to, to talk about your opinions and you know that no one will come back to you and say like oh why did you say that or or why did you not say that and and being free and I, I recently gave a, a, a presentation I met uh, the CEO of uh, Q Mariana this uh, dairy uh, farm and I really loved the, I, one of the ideas he was pitching there because he really wanted to mix milk and coke 
and and have that as a yeah you, right we could have told him that that would not work right <laughs> was that was the, that was like that was like tom's cinnamon uh, buns uh, no uh, the, 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 <laughs> the lemon buns, buns. Lemon buns. <laughs> no but so he wanted to try this and obviously that failed but what happened is that they made a museum it's opening up and and flat where they put all the failures mm, quite interesting. Yeah. they put yeah, all the failures that all or failures or things that did not work out but still they were reminded okay we tried it we did try it right we we have sort of this culture where we have this innovation culture that we we said okay well, let's just try this we it might not work but but you're not afraid of, of failure or it's okay to fail you create this this atmosphere and uh, it's about if you think that you are an orchestra or you're in a symphony or orchestra it's about you and all of us we are colleagues we could uh, we are playing this uh, you can look at an organization like that we are playing each of us each of our instruments but we're playing together it sounds really good right but also i know that i could get up with my instrument and i can play it and i know that you are listening and i know that you are rooting for me that you want me to do well and that you're saying okay and also i know that that sounds really beautiful when I play it alone, but I know it sounds really powerful when we're all playing it together. So I think that's sort of the, I will end it at there, but I want to say that to be able to have that orchestra playing it together, you need to have, um, you need to have focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging within the workplace. And you need also to have leaders that acknowledge that you want to sort of, that you have this leadership commitment to these values and to that ways of working but also you need to think about inclusion also starts with i it's this dual process and this connectedness with workers uh, and top management so i think this sort of is uh, feeding it on to you a little bit um Rune, about leadership and uh, yeah yeah thank you Martha. i really uh, enjoyed the kind of story about you know museum of failures because it's very difficult to learn anything without failing so why shouldn't it be celebrated also Reminds me about my previous university for Staffordshire in, in, in England, where they planned to tear down a building to build a new one, but they had to delay it with the year because they found some bats uh, in the old building, which were protected, of course. And, and rather than, of course, this was not as planned, but out of that came a bat celebration day. So because of it, fun as well, you know, because of these bats, we had to delay this, you know, tearing the building down with a year, but let's celebrate that, right? So uh, we, we perhaps we're not good enough at doing just that. So, of course, as, as with you, I've been listening to, to Joni Mitchell or uh, Tony, <laughs> Tony Mitchell, as, uh, as Tom would, would, would try to uh, lure us into believing. Mention. And um, uh, I, 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 I can't remember the lyrics by heart, so I had to write it down. So you can sing along if you want to. I'm not, I'm not going to sing. I'm, I'm going to uh, read it up. But there's, there's a section of, of the song called Fiction that really got me thinking. Uh, and I'm going to read it out to you. It sounds like I'm doing something very romantic here. Yeah. Uh, so, so Tom, you will you'll just jump from in you, with the chorus. Course, okay. Yeah, uh, I can't decide. I don't know which way to go. This is where you say, "Ooh." Uh, the more you learn, the less you know which way to go. Some follow blind and never know which way to go. To lead, you need some place to go. Which way to go? So Tom talked a little bit about complexity and how things are getting more and more complex. I'm actually, I acknowledge that, but I'm more, I'm more interested in the simplicity of, when you're looking at leadership, the simplicity of, of why, so of purpose, which we'll get back to. But we seem to have this agreement, common agreement in, in organizations, um, that leadership is really important. It's really important. And good leaders are worth their weight in gold these substantial bonuses, right? <laughs> but I, I really think that we confuse two things. So we, we confuse leadership with leaders. So very often I ask people, students and executives alike that, you know, define leadership. And we rarely define leadership. We end up defining leaders. Uh, and these are two different things. Uh, and it's a, a well-known book in the field of leadership called Leadership, uh, written in <laughs> Written in 1978, <laughs> easy to remember. <laughs> Written in 1978, and, and the author, James Burns, he writes that, you know, perhaps we know too much about leaders, but too little about leadership. So already then he makes a distinction, and perhaps not too much has happened since. And he goes on, this is his words, not, not mine, but he goes on to kind of explain that we are obsessed with leaders. 
we, we, we set out talking about leadership and we're obsessed with leaders. We're obsessed with how they look, how they talk, uh, you know, their haircut, what they have for breakfast, where they went on holiday, what car they drive, of course it's a Tesla, what kind of a pet they have, and this is where it's really his words, what they do in the bedroom. So it's kind of say or her, or now dog blind leg, yeah? uh, newspaper literature. We're obsessed with individuals rather than what is this thing, uh, leadership. But I would suggest, and I've done this before, and it's, it's, sometimes it's not stepping on toes, sometimes it's jumping on toes, because I, I suggest very often, uh, and it is to, to provocate that, that many leaders, many former leaders, they don't perform leadership. Uh, we, we have, we're getting more and more afraid of making decisions, because what might happen if I get it wrong? So let's, let's not make a decision today. And also suggest that many people who do provide leadership don't look at themselves as leaders. So very often I can ask if there's an audience, if, I have, if I'm lucky enough to have an audience, and I say, who here perform leadership? And, and it depends, but very often people are a little bit shy, because they don't want to show off. Some will be straight away, then I have a follow-up question. And here, many more say yes, or identify themselves to say. So first is, who here perform leadership? Some identify and then ask who here is a parent and very often many more will identify themselves because they are a parent a mother or a father and identify the perform leadership and my question is without making a judgment statement how can you be a parent without performing leadership uh you're going to say something that no, 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 you're a parent i'm sure you're performing yeah. leadership right I'm not uh, sure whether my kids would agree. <laughs> but, yeah, let's not go to the, the value judgment though. Oh, well, but a leader is just a sad German song. Is it? Well, there you go. Let's go beyond it then, right? Uh, so, I really agree, how could I not, that, that leadership is, is, is crucial. But I think that we need to refocus. Leadership is something we do, it's not something we are. We need to be able to perhaps talk about leadership without talking about leaders. And that's quite difficult because we've grown up. In an environment, I just went past a, a, a nursery, a kindergarten here the other day, and, and they kind of they written some core values on the outside wall on this nursery or kindergarten, and it, one was leadership. And I wonder how how do you how do you how do you talk about leadership with, with the kids of this age? Is it to be tough and make decisions, and get the others with you, and help others achieve things through others, or? Do we talk about leadership in a different way? I don't know. I don't work there. Perhaps I, sh I should visit. But if you watch these kindergarten groups that are all like pulled onto a rope, yes. which is dragged by by the, the uh, usually a woman, right? Um, that's leadership. Yeah, so you get them with you. So the leaders yes. in the front, yes. right? Of Physically, course. in this case. Yeah. And rope them in. Rope them in. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that leadership at the moment is rather exclusive, but it needs to become inclusive. So I think we need to focus much more on leadership. As, as a process, because the leaders in their own right or on their own are not really important. Leadership is what is important, and then how can we perform or contribute to, to leadership? So I think a real challenge today is that the dominant view of leadership is that no matter what we call it, X, Y, and Z, transformational, transactional, servant, whatever you want to call it, I call it whatever leadership, because you could call it whatever you want, it consists of three ingredients. So it's like you, you, you're cooking something. You say, we can cook whatever, but you only have three ingredients. So that's what you have. And ingredients number one is leader, or perhaps there's more than one, right? Ingredients number two is followers. And then ingredients number three is delivering on shared goals. Of course, these, these shared goals are rarely shared. They are kind of dictated to you because there's rarely a shared ownership of, of, these, of these goals. What we see then in conversations and in studies is that this, this view or this approach to leadership creates us and them. So in, in my kind of, with my editorial or editor, editor-in-chief hat on of Journal of Change Management, I, I have now got to a tendency of returning very early on in the process, uh, manuscripts sent, sent in that talks about managers and employees or leaders and employees because from the outset, then they encourage an us and them view. Because I'm very much thinking um, leaders or managers, they are also employees. You know, they were hired and most likely they can be fired. Very few of these managers or leaders own the company. So we're all in the same box. You know, we're working on the same team. 
And sometimes it doesn't look like that because we talk about us and them. So those that kind of informal leadership responsibilities talk at us, we have the helicopter view, and then the employees kind of down. And then those employees that are not in leadership uh, roles yet, they talk about us as employees. And we know what's happening down on the floor, but they, the people up there, they don't have a clue. They're detached. It's not a great ambience, I believe, us and them. And then there's something about, you know, words are important. Who think it is great to have a recipe where you have leaders and followers? Who wants to be a follower? It sounds a bit weak. I'm not suggesting that it is weak. Some would suggest that in this relationship, the most important is the first follower. If you don't have, if you're a leader and you don't have a first follower, you're just another lunatic, right? Doing your own thing. So the first follower is really, really important. But the word follower is not great. It suggests that your lang language consists of words like bah yeah you're a sheep you're following you're not challenging you're not sharing you're not asking questions you only engage when you're sent an engagement survey i don't think it's great so i think this dominant view is suggesting that only a privileged group of individuals and these individuals are very often male very often white sometimes lacking hair suits me well this this, this dominant view doesn't it uh, and very often they come from privileged socioeconomic and educational backgrounds. Not that long ago when you had a, uh, um, you know, we had the, the Lib Dems and uh, the Tories in the UK, you know, ruling together, which is not common. You could have a look at where does these leaders of the parties, the main parties come from? The, the Tories, the Lib Dems and Labour, they all came from either Oxford or Cambridge. So very similar educational background. And who are they representing? So I think it is it's pure nonsense to suggest that only a small group of special individuals can perform leadership. I think, of course, it's nonsense. And everyone say, well, yeah, of course, it's nonsense. It's nonsense that only men can perform leadership. This is 2021, Norway. Have a look at who is the CEO of the leading Norwegian companies registered on the stock exchange. You don't have a lot of women there. There are not a lot of women there at all. Uh, so we're not perhaps as, as, as advanced as we would like to think. So my, my view is that leadership is important. It's crucial. If that is to uh, private sector organization, public sector, third sector. Uh, but I think our current view of leadership is a main or at least a major barrier to leadership development. And if we can't get on with this leadership uh, uh, development required to meet the current and future challenges, we're in, in deep S, I'm not allowed to swear. So I think it's, it's really time that we talk more about leadership without mentioning the word leaders or followers. And that's really challenging, try to do that. How, how, can, we, how can we talk about leadership without talking about leaders and followers? Well, we can. Uh, and I said that one option of the dominant view at the moment, no matter what you call the leadership, something leadership, is consists of the three ingredients is leader, follower, delivering on shared goals. And very often this is leader delivering on shared goals through followers. It sounds pretty painful. Yeah, I'm going to do this through you. And you don't have a say, by the way, but I'm really good at getting this thing done through you. So there is, there is an alternative, um, and there's something called uh, the, the DAC ontology, or DAC approach, which is, which is basically suggesting that rather than talking about leadership as something happening between leaders, followers, delivering on shared goals, we could, we could focus on leadership as the production, it's a rather harsh word, so I, I prefer facilitation. So leadership could be seen as the facilitation of direction, alignment, and commitment. Uh, in my recent work, I kind of I, I try to blow some dust of this model called the DAC model because it hasn't been given enough attention. Uh, so I, I try to further develop the direction element into purpose because purpose is, a, is wider and it's a greater purpose, higher purpose. I'm not thinking, I'm not talking about religion. Uh, it could be for, to some, um, but I'm talking about something that is that is meaningful to more than just yourself or your team, your division, department or, or organization. And I'm talking about Purpose Beyond Profit. This is a great book uh, called Built to Last by Colin Wilson Porras. They, they followed 18, 
which they call great companies, all private sector, all but one based in, in the US, uh, and then it was plus you know, Sony in Japan. And the way they identified the great companies was purely based on, on, on if you had invested in them when they went, went on the stock, stock market. And they say if you invested in them, you would have done much better than invested in, in a comparable uh, organization. And they said the two things, the two things we found they had in common is that the, the, the magic word called and, so or, not either or, uh, because in, in academia and in practice we often talk about um, stability or change. But they said, no, the magic word is and, stability and change. We can't, we can't stop change, you know, change is happening, but it isn't new. We keep talking about change as being something new. You know, change has been going on for ages. We have evolved. That's the strength of human beings. We actually embrace change. We don't resist change as a literature and a, a lot of and many managers uh, like like to, to to think, at least say. Um, so we do both. For example, purpose shouldn't be changed every time you have a new CEO. The purpose of an organization. I used to be an old Boy Scout and we had like a formos paragraph. That didn't change every time we had a new chief scout. Okay. Um, and the second thing they said is, or found that these 18 companies, all private sector, they had a purpose beyond profit. Not purpose instead of profit. Some people say, oh, yeah, purpose, nice to have if you're a teacher or a nurse. Come on. Purpose is what gets you up in the day. Purpose is what makes you bounce back once you've fallen over and perhaps broken a leg. Purpose is what was identified in, in, in a group of young adolescents that did not have the best start of life because they, they were looked after by the state. And you had a, uh, some researchers that asked these uh, adolescents, do you have a purpose in life? They didn't define purpose to them. They defined the purpose themselves. It could be a religion. It could be Manchester United, right? But do you have a purpose in life? And they defined themselves. Yes, we have a purpose. No, we don't have a purpose. And then they followed these adolescents, these two groups of adolescents through life. And they found out that those who have identified themselves to have a purpose in life did much better. High levels of education, no, more stable family lives, better health. So purpose is, is, is really important. So to round off here, like, like Joni or Tony puts it, Tom, <laughs> we need some place to go. Yeah, we need some place to go. We need somewhere to contribute to on the journey. And this is what purpose can provide us with, no matter if we're in private sector, public sector, or third sector, a destination to move towards. So closing words is my working definition uh, on, on leadership these days, is that leadership is not something leaders do. Leadership is the collective pursuit of delivering on purpose. Something we do together. So what do you think? Great, <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bruno, Marta, Sid, and Tom, for these very thought-provoking, very interesting uh, contributions. Uh, I very much enjoyed listening to all of them so far. Very smooth transitions all the way. Really great. Thanks, to, actually, thanks to Johnny. They, they were actually so great. I had a couple of comments I wanted to make to your presentations, but then you had so smooth uh, transitions to the other one that I said, no, I'm not going to interrupt. <laughs> and I think that's a great uh, segue because now we really have time to actually address any questions that came up during these uh, nice presentations, either within the group or from you out there on the machines, on the phones, on the tellies. And uh, yeah, maybe we can get right in. Uh, maybe I can, because uh, Women's Talk is still warm in our minds, maybe we can start from the, from the back. And uh, I had the first question by uh, Thibault Freyd. Um, what happens if many people wants to want to be leaders? So uh, you have this, this group of people and, and maybe there's a goal that we want to achieve. And is there, is there a good way how to then somehow organize who is leading what part of, of the, the enterprise, so to say? Hmm. So again, then my, 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 my challenge in the reply would be, let's, let's try not to focus on the leader and the role. Let's, let's try to focus on the activity and the process of leadership. But again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that in the future we will have total anarchy or everyone is on, on the same level. We have no leaders or everyone is a leader. But, but you can have, have a look at the birds migrating mm -hmm. from colder climates to warmer mm -hmm. climates. They're, they're flying like an arrow. It's not the same bird in the front the whole journey along. Yeah. 
So the, the, the bird will fly in front and lead, and then will fly back, and someone else will take over. Yeah. So this is something that, that, that we can learn from, from. but we, we have too much invested in this kind of notion of leaders, because leaders is like, I'm part of the B team, I'm better than someone else sometimes, and it's kind of a, an elite education. Um, so I think, if we, I think, in a way, per definition, if everyone that provides or contributes to leadership is a leader, then it's not a problem that we're all leaders, right? But of course, in an organization, we need to define areas of responsibility, we need someone who can make a decision. We can't, oh, we're on Titanic. And, oh, look, an iceberg. Let's all have a vote. That, that's not going to happen, right? So in that situation, so this is my responsibility. We're turning, what is it, left or right, but that's not the right language for on a boat. Um, starboard and port. Starboard and port. Thank you. There's some port. Yeah. So, so, so I do think that um, we should be less focused on the word leader, leaders, more focused on leadership as a process and how we can contribute and we shouldn't even if we are uh, even if we are a former leader or uh, are looking at becoming former leaders i think we then need to know that we we don't need to know all the questions and all the answers ourselves we need to, we need strong teams okay what was the question that yes you with me? If, if i if i listen to that i just wonder um to what extent this literature and leadership has been influenced by basically the military um, research on, on military yeah, operations yeah. because I, I think that at least stimulated a lot of these sorts and this hierarchies and, and we all follow this mm. one person this male dominated uh, approach I just wonder whether there's there's any connection there because I would imagine that yeah well you, what what, what informs what you, you have you have the great man theory that is kind of you, you you are you know are you born or bred you know what one of the biggest challenges for both sides in, in the first world war was that in order to become an officer you have to be born with a certain surname with, with blue blood and that was not necessarily the best leaders necessarily right if you're not born with the right surname the max you, you become a, you can become a sergeant uh, and now today we say no of course this is we don't believe in the great man uh, theory but but yes we do because we're still very much focused on, on tra traits and characteristics you know so at, at one point in time you know the the sales of turtlenecks and, and, and round glasses uh, boom because everyone wanted to be like you know who Steve Jobs. Um, so I don't I don't know what came first, but we, we, we haven't parked, we haven't left behind the, the notion of the great man theory, which is a pity. A fiction. It is fiction. I, I think that. Th 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 thank you, uh, uh, Sid. I, I think that it's a fiction that it's leaders only that provide leadership, but it's a fiction that we some of us en enjoy. Yeah. You said in the beginning that um, and you could actually propose a much more simple approach, but I, I just wonder, maybe this uh, obsession with uh, focus on the leader comes uh, with that this one is observable. So also from a research perspective, you can actually observe the leader, you can describe it. It's relatively simple, while actually the process of leading appears to be much more complex to grasp also empirically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And then yeah, it's just a scapegoat. You, you basically say, well, focus on the leader because we know what good leaders do is good leadership, mm. and we can't observe leadership. Right? Yeah, so it's also, the, I think, that, yeah, thanks, Tom. I think it's a challenge of the simplistic things to measure as well because it's become more and more important to measure things, and then what's easy to measure becomes more important, and what's more complex to measure becomes less important. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not a betting person, but I would put money on, you know, within 18 months of having a new CEO in a, in a major organization, there will be structural changes. But, but this, do you think that that would be different from different contexts? Like, would you think that this focus that you have now uh, talked about, do you think that's perceived differently? And I mean, if you're, not if you talk about military organizations, but if you talk about Norway and we have this Nordic model of, of leadership and sort of flat structures and mm. so how do you envision that being different? I mean you talked a little bit about resistance to change and, and, and envisions of continuity and, 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 and that whole sort of aspect but would you envision that being different in the Nordic context? Your the purpose and sort of not having this leader problem than in the States or in Germany or in India or in somewhere else? Yeah, I think, I think quite clearly that there will be kind of cultural differences, um, but I think uh, that purpose in itself will, will have a, a, an essential role to play in, in whatever culture. And I don't think that our, our kind of uh, 
democratic model in, in Norway. I'm not sure how democratic it is. We just like to think that it is. Uh, but of course, the purpose can be different. But again, from these studies from Collins to Porras, so so built to last. But yes, all these 18 companies were private sector, but they were ranging from you know tobacco manufacturer to health company. Uh, uh, and then uh, in in this particular health company, they said our our. It sounds a bit like lab well, here in Stavanger, you know, which which I think is is is, is a great example. But this American company said, you know, our purpose is to save as many lives as possible. And if we do a great job out of that, we will make money for our owners. So making money for the owners was not number one, because they thought this will this will just happen if we are really good at delivering on our purpose. But of course, if, 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 if the company purpose was then to save as many lives as possible, that wouldn't then change next time automatically you, you hire a new CEO. You make sure that that new CEO, external or internal appointment, fit with the purpose. But of course, this is very often we want something tangible. We want it quick. So if, if you're if you're hiring a new CEO, who do you give the job to? The person who says, I, I think that my predecessor or the predecessor, the person the job now has started something really fabulous. And I think my job for the first five years will be to follow up on the implementation of the decision already made. Or will we hire someone that is, yeah, I will, I'm going to promise you something fancy new and I'm going to slash costs and we're going to be mega efficient. Who do we give the job? Most likely the second one. I'm not sure but, if I yeah. answered your question. No, but I think it's a really good, uh, if I can just reflect on, sure. a little bit on that, because I think there's, a, there's this recent article that I just read on um, some research done in uh, amongst the Swedish firefighters. And it's really, it's, it's tapping into a little bit of, of uh, what you were talking about and also some of, of this diversity research. But what they found there is that, you know, there's this pressure also for having um, more you know you, you talked about on the stock market uh, how there's very few females but also we know that minority groups are, are not really represented on the stock market they're not represented in, in you know any organization basically here in Norway at least uh, on, on the higher level but so what they found in this study looking into Swedish firefighters is that you know there's this pressure of okay we need to have more diversity we need to count diversity we need to put that into different positions but then uh, in the organization, they don't want that. They don't want to change. They don't want the oxygen tanks to be smaller, to fit females or, or, or to fit whatever, you know? Mm. They, they, they are really happy the way they, the, the way they are. And they, their well-being, which is often can be linked to, you know, innovation or whatnot, is linked to this, um, this uh, tilhörighet, like this, uh, what do you call belonging. it? Like, huh? Belonging. Yeah, belonging to that homosocial group belonging mm. to firefighters that they can work out together we are tough guys we are doing this together they have this purpose mm. but that same purpose is preventing them from being inclusive to other groups within mm. uh, the organization so what would you do then like if you have this very strong purpose yes and as you mentioned you can really like put forward um, your ideas and it can, it's really important but at the same time you have sort of this pressure politically or, or, or in or in the society that we need to increase um... yeah, of course I didn't I didn't make a kind of a normative statement around purpose and leaders so it's like good or bad but but in my work I'm, I'm talking about kind of internal goods versus external goods so purpose I, I suggest and believe should be informed by internal goods which is basically what's what's good for most and, and when I'm going to give an example, it's very often a UN Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, one we, we have equality there. Um, and of course, you have this, this it's, it's a major challenge because you have these people, oh, she only got the job because she's a woman, or he only got the job because he got a different surname. Something, something wrong there. Yeah. And we're not helping helping ourselves. I have this kind of this kind of feeling every time it says, you know, you had, who was going to start the new uh, airliner during the COVID? It was Thor. Hmm. And you had this picture of, yeah. of the new of the new top management group, and they're all men, all white, all in the same age group, all dressed the same. And someone said, "This is a this is this is not a great signal." And someone said, "I thought quite ah, that's a really nice uh, steward uniform they put on there, right?" Mm -hmm. But the point was there. Oh no, no, the, this new group, this new airline, they, they get the money. They 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 really they're all for diversity, and they've been looking really hard to find women, but there were none. There were no no women, women with the right background, education, or experience, which which of course is nonsense. And, and my 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 view is basically when people say we need the right person, and that's very often a man. And I'm very often thinking for every right man, there's at least 
one or two right women. We just need to encourage this. Maybe there came a question up uh, from uh, Thibault right when this conversation was happening and uh, his question is, is the culture of Janteloven, the, the egalitarian style of the, the Nordic countries, is that compatible with innovation as a process? Is, is, is that something, can you be efficient in innovation within the democratic process? Just a, a quick answer, because coincidentally I've just I came across a study that partly answers this question and that right. is a um, very simplified view when on a leadership, more structural perspective. And they found actually that if you have a very, in an organization, a very uh, hierarchical structure, um, that makes, in, in terms of innovation, a difference from a flat structure, so far so clear, but they also figure that if you have a very flat hierarchy, this is really good for stimulating innovation, the creation of new things or inventions much more, but actually a hierarchical structure seems to be much better for selecting them amongst these, yeah. these different ideas and, and really um, making these, uh, putting them into reality in the end. Mm -hmm. um, so you could a little bit argue also, if you believe in such a simplification, that of course one model, let's say the Nordic model, which I would argue is more, uh, more flat in, in terms of hierarchy, then would accordingly be much better to bring up new innovation, but maybe be less efficient in uh, realizing those. But that was at the organization level, so I don't know whether we can really transfer these findings directly to the state level, probably not. But in, in general, I think that was really what the question was addressing. Mm. Within an organization, <laughs> I'm telling you, Twitter is yeah. a valuable source for well, literature these days. Well, it is. Still have to read the studies. So. Yeah. And also, of course, I'm not sure how how valid Jan uh, Delorgan is any longer because it's basically don't believe you better than anyone else, and, and I, I think we kind of passed that, um, you know, which which is a challenge. But they're, they're they're good good and bad with 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 the law. Mm -hmm. Then there's different kinds of better. Oh, this is kind of becoming a philosophical com conversation. Well, then, uh, it's Just kind of linked with the idea of uh, leadership as uh, um, nurturing a sense of purpose. Mm. Um, where if you have better, not as this is what we all mean by better, mm. but as this is what you could be better at than others, and this is what you could be better at, and that works mm. together, then, then we get a... a a work culture in which a flat hierarchy is pretty productive because people are fulfilling roles that all are synergistic rather than ones where you're sort of competing with your peers so that yeah. you feel like there's only room for so much at the top. Yeah. There's a fantastic little book called Chrysalis. Chrysalis are like the pupa um, that you know caterpillars hatch out of. Mm. And the metaphor there is of a caterpillar pillar where all the caterpillars are crawling up to get to the top and at the top there's this whisper that there's nothing there mm -hmm. and then the whole landscape is littered with caterpillar pillars mm. that is raised to the top and then then there's sort of a few butterflies up in the air of what you could have as realized potential versus the kind of rat race or mm. and and the other name the book goes by is hope for the butterflies mm. Mm. So, or hope for the flowers but the idea that you could uh, you could think differently and get to a destination that we don't presume is somewhere at the top that involves stepping over, mm -hmm. over others. Mm. We have a question from uh, Alex Nielsen following up on this. Uh, do you think uh, that there is a difference between innovation in Denmark and Norway and whether different countries are just interpreting Janteloven in a different fashion uh, so that uh, uh, somehow there's difference in, in innovative strength between the Nordic countries because they, while still having an egalitarian model in, in, in some form, they, they implement it differently. Is there, is there some work on comparing the different Nordic countries when it comes to Yeah, there is a lot of work on that. And, and there is, uh, I mean, I don't remember all exactly, but there's, I was actually looking at, there's a, there's a new report, uh, and if I know who that is, we, I, can, I can send it along, but there's a new report also on, on distinguishing between the Nordic countries and also the U European countries on, on green innovation, for example, seeing how we are, we are doing in, in terms of, um, of greening of innovation. And also in Norway, I guess we've been ranked many times as, not as sort of the, the lead uh, innovator country, but more like a follower. But I think a lot of things are happening now, and we can see that also 
because of COVID-19 and, and the climate crisis, they're, they're wicked problems that needs to be solved from, you know, from a diverse uh, perspective. But we could also see that COVID-19 has led to increased digitalization, it's led to increased greening, but that's also from the investor side. You can see that the investor side have now emphasized and are willing to pay more for those solutions. So I would reckon also that we would see, we're seeing a shift now that would be really interesting to pursue in, in terms of how we are doing. And also because of Norway and our dependence on on, um, on oil and, and, you know, all those innovations that have been very restricted, we are in a phase now of restructuring uh, in terms of, uh, you know, our, our companies, entrepreneurship, in terms of regions. So we are in a phase where we actually need to maybe not make a... Uh, lemon buns but we need to sort of also create something well, to, there's, to a lot, there's a lot of good uh, places doing donuts and bomba and uh, yeah that would be yeah. nice too but i don't know if there you want to add something but i mean there are a lot of rankings but i'm not I'm, i don't think actually that i've seen rankings based on yantalaman but that is no, I, maybe I, you read something in that article. No, I, I don't know. That. I mean, they, they <laughs> maybe you see something that, on Twitter. Tom will now write this. <laughs> yes. No, but, but I, I think uh, one of the, the things that, that Martha didn't mention, yeah. although she definitely knows and, and embraces about it, is that actually um, this, this view at the national level might not be all that informative. Because yeah. uh, what, what parts of the mm -hmm. literature we are contributing to actually shows is that there are much bigger differences or heterogeneity at the regional uh, level. Regional. So you actually find much yeah. bigger differences, let's say, between Copenhagen and whatever remote place in Denmark there is, Kolding maybe, yeah. I don't know, sorry, don't, I think nothing bad against Kolding, I don't know, just as an example, and between um, uh, Oslo and, and a remote place in Norway, then actually between um, the two countries. Yeah. So I think and this is also where, where partly cultural differences come in, but it's also sectoral not differences as well. So I know that's a lot of work done on that as well. That these okay. sectoral differences that might explain uh, and so geographies as well, um, both physical but also cultural geographies, particular trajectories of countries, but certainly also proximity to a certain sort of European hub for Denmark, given that Copenhagen is a, a significant chunk of the population. Um, and that the country isn't as large uh, and as sort of uh, mountainous and sort of remote in a different sense as Norway. I think there's certainly effects there of the Orson region uh, developing, you know, to people living in Malmo, Lund, yeah. um, Copenhagen is more the, serving the function of a regional capital than Stockholm. The distance yeah. there is, you know, five hours uh, drive. And so I think there's dynamics there of cross-border pollination also with Germany that are just distinct to what we have in, uh, in a Norwegian setting. But, but, but also think it's something in this notion of you know, how, how well are we doing. So we have Jan, the, law of, uh, the law of Jan, but we also have this kind of notion it's typical Norwegian to be good or be yeah. best, right? And, 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 and Norway in many ways, you know, we, year after year we're amongst the, the top, kind of the best countries to live in, but also we, we fit very well with, with more than one definition of developing countries because we are, we are overly reliant on a very small number of raw material, oil, gas, fish, for example. And, and how much of that do we add value on? You know, look at how much we pump up or fish up and then send abroad. And then others are innovative about what they do with the raw material because they don't have necessarily the raw material themselves. So I think Norway, we, we're going we're gonna to have a real shock. Uh, when 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 oil and gas is no longer or no longer what what sells in the markets, so I would say, uh, I would observe that Denmark is is further ahead now when it comes to this transition to green economy. They're taking some really tough and decisive choices about what energy they're investing in. You had a new uh, report out was it a couple of days ago suggesting that we need to stop. We're going to meet the targets yield uh, to emission targets. We need to stop. We should not explore any more. Uh, oil uh, fields in Norway, and the government is saying, of course, we're going to explore. More. And the converse Danish example is uh, Rustad Energy that moved its, uh, into its confidence on uh, energy sector analytics away from oil and gas towards developing core expertise in a in a sector that's going to be in demand with yeah. a transition. Mm -hmm. So, going to be a little bit controversial. Just I think in Norway we're we're a bit ahead of many other countries because we have the gift of the nature. Mm -hmm. And we are far, far behind a lot of other countries, but we don't feel it yet. Now, just as an example, look at how, how much you pay for Wi-Fi in Norway compared to in Sweden. Because we, we have money to spend. There, there's no reason to, that we should pay the double for Wi-Fi, just as an example. But us consumers in Norway compared to Sweden, but we do, gladly. 
I have one comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to contradict, contradict yeah. that, not with Wi-Fi, but with mobile internet, since there's free uh, roaming uh, in Europe. I do still have a Danish number four years down the line, and I don't pay uh, half as much as a Norwegian number would cost me no. um, on for internet. And um, it's supporting your point, but but just to say that it, it's it's yeah. those cross-border um, um, possibilities mm. do actually make it possible to sign out of. Oh yes, that. yes, yes. And but how many do that? How many go goes you know contract hunting outside of borders? Because yeah, good point. Nobody who uses VIX. <laughs> no, no, exactly. Uh, I uh, got one comment that I would like to follow up on from Inhi uh, Jo because uh, she was saying that. Uh, do I understand correctly that leadership came was described as something negative because we should go away from looking at the leader? Uh, but maybe this is not what you want no, to say. No. But uh, somehow the the focus on the person of the leader is what you're trying to somehow dissuade people from just staying with that. Yes. I I think um, I think uh, thanks for clarifying. I think. Our focus, if our focus on leaders both limits and is limiting. So I think that we have, if we can look at leadership as something more than just individual leaders, and if we can look at leadership as a process that more of us, I'm not saying all of us, but more of us can contribute to rather than a small group of individuals, it's a bigger group of individuals who can contribute to leadership, then per definition everyone contributing to the process of leadership is a leader and that's all positive. Yeah. Thanks. I think the, the example you gave before, right, with this, um, with this birds, is just perfect. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah the, the one with the birds. Exactly. There is no yes. leader per se, but it's a kind of rotating principle, and and they just follow each other and then lead each other at the same time. Yeah. And it's a system issue. It's the, the position yes. of leading the pack, but the the person is somewhat interchangeable. Yes. The important element here is they know, and they yeah. they agree to where they're going. They have ah, a destination, yeah, yeah, yeah. they have a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. purpose. So not when the one is in they're the They're not back. arguing, they're not flying in all yeah. sorts of different directions. Right? Yeah, they also no, have a yeah. democratic vote. <laughs> Perhaps I mean, vote. We don't observe them all the time. <laughs> yeah. But I think it points to a very important part also. Um, there was this study done uh, in a call center in the United States among 30,000 employees. And they wanted they asked the question, like, who is the most happy employee here? And, um, and they realized that the most happy employees working in this call center were the ones that had Firefox or Google Chrome installed on their computers. And I mean, that's just excellent, right? Excellent research. But the reason why, you know, and here comes the clue, it's not sort of yeah. some dubious <laughs> thing. No, no, no. But I'm looking forward to that yeah. conclusion. Uh, Mark could just invest in Firefox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so <laughs> the download numbers are yeah. just exploding right now. You know, the, the point was that when these 30,000 employees when they came to their uh, to to start working uh, in this company what was the default on the computers was internet explorer so the most happy people at work i mean i think it links to purpose but the one who actively had sought to change it mm -hmm. but i think this is uh, comes to the cost because i don't know about you guys but on my computer if i don't have the administrative password i cannot change anything so if we think about this as a metaphor right mm -hmm. you have to be able to to log on to your computer and change it. So it's a two-way process. Mm. You are taking the initiative to change something on your computer that you don't like, but you're also given the opportunity to do so because you don't have some silly administrative password that you need to have access to. I think that that's also like a little bit speaks, that, that mm. was what I, popped up in my mind when I, when I listened yeah. about this, these birds. So I that can, was just a little... <laughs> I can, uh, come in there i think it's a fantastic example but it's op it opens up to multiple readings yes as well. it does <laughs> and, uh, and i think one, one of those that i want to sort of pull us out of the, the organizational reference frame yeah. and think a little bit also of individuals because uh, not everybody works within large organizations or mm. even in context even if you're working in a small setup uh, leadership is not necessarily the the guiding value or the mm. big, a big part of the conversation and for many people it's a self-employed situation or doing something um, where you can also come out of left field into making a contribution yeah. or you can make a contribution that's not seen as a great revolutionary thing in society and yet mm. uh, it's one of the things that adds a lot of value yeah. to people's lives. And there I think um, there's you know something going on that your example captures that has to do with initiative yeah. and yeah, being proactive and finding 
um, or the literature on improvisation is really, uh, and, and the term in Hindi is jugar, that sort of improvisation filling a lot of gaps, which for instance in many contexts are left by the state, leads mm -hmm. to innovation yeah. uh, of a sort that, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to fill as well with a public or private sector yeah. solution as somebody seeing a particular opportunity to add value. Mm -hmm. Now what enables that sort of perception? What enables that kind of space for not just sort of having those ideas, but having somebody able to do them? Mm -hmm. And then thinking of that mobility sector example, I'm talking about digitalization, which is sort of innovation. I think a lot of that space and what happens there is conditioned by incumbents, is conditioned by purchasing power, lobbying power, um, reach to policy, and sort of taking over the popular, the social imaginary of what is the sector, what does mobility mean? And that really chokes the possibility for alternative imaginaries, for people to champion solutions that are more diverse, are more hybridized. And it's a real, real sort of like getting out of the rut sort of problem. Because if you don't have enough people pushing for a certain sort of change, then somebody who wants to create that finds it much harder to channel the kind of opportunities that they would need to convert you know, initiative into leadership to create a sense of shared purpose. Yeah. So one example to pick up on the mention of NAF would be a bus Brooklyners uh, for like a bus users association. Seems obvious. I mean, a lot of people use buses, but that doesn't exist in Norway. All it yeah. takes is one person and then another person to found that, right? Yeah. And, and, and so that kind of, to me, part of the not bringing it also into this question of Nordic values and I think part of that is the idea of collectivism, the idea of being able to come into a, a form of intersubjective consensual progress that I think we've been very good at in some ways but uh, but you know there are clearly gaps and you talked about sort of certain kinds of tendencies of certain people to be in influential positions and just to flag uh, Bergen and Nerings or the Bergen Chamber of Commerce they started this program called Bergen Opportunity a couple of years ago and it's been very popular bringing diverse multi-ethnic sorts of people into future leadership positions and creating like an enabling space for that sort of mentorship that sort of, and I think there's many examples of that sort and those are really things that I think are fantastic to see happening within a Norwegian ecosystem that there's recognition and then there's action and that action isn't a very fixed this is how we define future growth and excellence and leadership it's saying we need to create that space for diversity and to support multiple sorts of uh, I mean you're part of the sick uh, forum and I feel like there's uh, that's probably also an interesting example <laughs> yeah yeah most probably it is I mean I think uh, that that network um, is is also a place where you meet people with um, that have a purpose I can really relate to that but also that they are um, driven by something that is larger than themselves so it's something i think this collectivism that you that you spoke about is is something that's really important there and also with this uh un sustainable development goals like mm. uh, number 17 or yeah. or you know working together enabling. Driven, huh? yeah, enabling. It, enabling and, and sort of really developing something together i think is, is crucial also and something that is a driving force and it's really a positive stream of energy uh, of young leader, leaders and talents uh, moving forward so i think that's optimistic uh, for the future and i think we need to we also need to look at our educational system and perhaps focus more on what you just said enabling mm. rather than defining what success look like mm. Let, let's focus on enabling people and they can define their own success yes. rather than us yes. defining what that success looks like you have all conversation these days should should we give uh, marks or grades uh, on, uh, on schoolwork uh, in, uh, in Norway, uh, which is a political debate. And then this, I saw this case where actually by law, you have, to give, uh, you have to give an overall mark in each subject area at the end of the year, but you don't need to give a mark on, on tests. So in one, in one school, they didn't give marks on tests, but they gave extensive feedback, written mm -hmm. and verbal. Mm -hmm. Because they said with, with the marks, it becomes a competition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't become about learning. It becomes a competition about getting the best marks, and everyone, of course, to think they deserve the best marks. So I really think that let's spend more time and energy on on enabling individuals and let them define their own success. I think with this is uh, with these grades is quite interesting because originally the idea was you get grades as a kind of signal um, whether you're, you have abilities or skills that match basically this direction. 
Mm. Right. So it was was much more about okay, if you get a, a bad grade, let's say, all it means uh, meant is um, maybe that's not your strength. Look for someplace else. Mm. Right. Um, and sometimes it's made literally a, a different place, but in, in, in many cases, not not, not necessary. Different and country, country even. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> leave countries, right? go to a country. No, I, and I think this is really uh, an idea to go forward, right? So it's not about getting the best grade, but actually finding more or less the area where you get the best grades, mm -hmm. kind of. And this is, I think, uh, what finding what, your purpose. Precisely, mm -hmm. finding our purpose, and I think uh, by the, the real problem is not giving the grades, but then in the end, throw them all together and average them. Mm. Like, what's the point in that? That basically tells you you have rather diversified skills and you're relatively good at any and in multiple uh, uh, areas. But is this any better than, than somebody who really excels in one uh, yeah. aspect? And even then, like at, at the university, we don't automatically provide the students with feedback unless they oh, ask yeah. for it. We give them marks. But even if you get an A, you would like to know how did you get an A? Yeah. How, how could you keep getting an A? But this thing, what happens, so what can be measured becomes important and learning becomes less important. The marks become more important. And then look to, again to the UK, you have this grade inflation where the A is no longer good enough. So they create a new mark, which is A star. So imagine then when everyone gets an A star, what are you going to have then? A double star? So you're losing the whole point of the constellation. Constellation, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, maybe a slight turn in, in topic. Uh, our very own Mark van der Giesen uh, posted a question. Um, I think uh, to your uh, contribution, Tom, uh, regarding the increasing complexity of things, and he's uh, wondering. Uh, if things become uh, in daily life as complex as the Boeing 747 that you were mentioning uh, and many things can actually fail, does the consumer maybe not feel in charge anymore and by that actually people get fed up of this, this modern society because they uh, somehow they, they feel they're, they're really not in control anymore of all these complex things around them. There are too many shiny and complex ones. Um, yeah, I think what I had in mind primarily was much more technological complexity and this also refers much more mm -hmm. to, let's say, social complexity or the complexity of daily and social life. Um, so I think it's, it's important to keep those apart because sometimes complex technological things may have relatively simple interfaces that allow us to handle these type of things. Um, even though, so take take a car for instance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, hardly any of us knows how the car really works in detail and we're still able to drive, right? But mm -hmm. um, the other point is indeed something that is um, that is discussed. So whether the complexity of our society, which primarily results from that we all specialize ever more into narrow areas, um, because we have to excel what, what has been in the past, we, we build on that and in order to move on, we have to specialize even further and further. Um, this implies also that you, you get kind of good in one thing, but you lose the ability to feel like an expert, or at least a decent uh, user in another area. And this is indeed put forward as, as maybe one of the reasons why people feel a little bit uncomfortable or increasingly uncomfortable and have this feeling, I don't understand what's going on anymore. Um, but I, I think this is still, um, that's not really my field of research. I'm, do not have the perfect overview on, on that one. Um, so that's Thanks. Like, uh, I thought the question would be when will you share your PowerPoint with all the stats? I'm still waiting for that. Oh, it's, it's already here. It's, it's, it's yeah. already in there. But, um, before you continue, I have actually a, a, a wonderful observation of the our three talks. Yeah. Um, and that is. Um, Partly is also related to us. Don't feel yes, excluded. Really 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 I'll just leave, <laughs> shall I? Oh, sorry. Uh, but what do you think is the greatest invention in terms of value generation mankind ever did? So what is the greatest invention of all times in terms of um, um, economic impact? Pubs. The wheel. Plumbing. The wheel, pubs, close. Plumbing. No, a producto, yeah. So it's this, uh, is that what you mean? I was actually thinking about uh, get, oh, the, the plumbing, the, the the plumbing uh, that gets the water the wait, from the aqueduct into your house. But yeah, so it was. No, but let's think about it a little bit since you uh, can we think about it? Yeah, I, I wanted to yeah, say exactly. 
it's not related to technology. No, it's not. Even though whenever we oh, use the word innovation, we're already triggered to think yeah. uh, technologically, yes. let's say. It's not. It's something more social. Beer. So. <laughs> 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 it brings people together. together. No, actually, just, um, I mean, firstly, it's, it's hard to, to measure that anyway, it's right? A, it's a common language. It's a city. Ah, it's it's an accelerated yeah, okay, yeah. invention of yeah. mankind because why? Because it brings together diversity, mm. yeah. uh, or at least heterogeneity, mm. and puts them into physical proximity, which allows them for, for all these types of uh, interaction from which hopefully something new, or at least in the past, usually something good evolved, sometimes also something bad, but at least something good. I, I have to add the but, um, since cities uh, give us a lot of shiny toys, and that's sort of my. Uh, my uh, uh, theme for the night. Um, the but is that uh, that's probably true in a certain way of measuring things in a, a hegemonic uh, capitalist uh, system that uh, metricizes economic growth um, based on value that we can capture, right? And uh, and cities also have some of the greatest externalities, uh, many of the greatest negative environmental externalities that get either pushed out into the region, into the hinterland, into the extractive zones, the sacrifice zones as they're often called. Um, electric car is a good example where, you know, draining virtual water from places like the Andes in Bolivia, getting the lithium and other rare earth metals out from places that don't at all get the benefits of... Uh, so there, there I have to say about yeah. it because if you really look at the, um, the resource efficiency, then cities are much better than rural places. Uh, it's only that, of course, uh, it's hard, firstly, to, to, to disentangle that because yeah. the use of, of tools or, and of man-made stuff is different in cities than it is in, uh, in rural areas, right? So, but if you control for that one, you do see, indeed, that at least in terms of, let's say, the most general thing is energy consumption, right? So, that's the basis, let's say. And in terms of energy consumption, uh, the same activity in the city basically generates a higher value or a higher um, um, output, so to speak, as uh, outside the city. So my other but is... Uh, yeah, is that's because they have is, services and then you have manufacturing... No, but even if you control for that. Yeah, okay. so be, think about the road, right? If you build a kilometer of road, how many people can actually use that or connect it in a rural area in comparison to two skyscrapers that are connected in the city, for instance, right? So the usage of this infrastructure is much, much more efficient, meaning more people use it um, than in rural areas. This is another but. It is yeah. another but. It's, it's the and the but. No, but I was butted into it. <laughs> um, the but also starts with a B. It's banality. Um, cities are. We had uh, we had a guy called David Graeber, uh, a late great anthropologist, uh, in in Stavanger um, a year and a half ago, and um, and uh, he he's famous for, among other things for having written a book called uh, uh, Bullshit Jobs. Mm. Um, sort of those, you know, yeah. not to not to talk down on a call center job, but people doing something day in and day out, that sort of assembly line stuff. The people that are actually define their own jobs as bullshit, so no one else defined them as bullshit. There he goes. Yeah. The, yeah. the book he talked about, which he never got to then write while he was uh, here, um, was called Batshit Constructions. I was talking about the massive construction boom in China and building buildings that you then like force people to go live into and creating in a sense uh, fake cities around and i'm not going to go into that example but the the reason i say banality is a big but is that cities in themselves are neither more or less efficient as spatial organization as collective forms i completely agree i'm a big fan of cities i love living in them um but we are only as good at using something as the values and the purpose that drives us so studies that you would do of travel of people living in cities as opposed to sort of spatially dispersed which is much more inefficient in terms of you know having to commute you can't really service that with public transport you'd use a car etc um it's not really close enough a cycle they the people who live in cities in close proximity usually to a large airport fly much more often on average not everyone right and that one return flight a year and they do much more than that that they take more than somebody who lives uh, in, a, in the hinterland, actually consumes far more energy in terms of the annual consumption than anything that they save with the efficiencies of, uh, of even owning a car or not. It's m 
that where we incentivize consumerist behavior, not because cities are per definition bad, they're actually, as you said, rather good, but because the model of cities as engines of growth, which, you know, people like uh, Edward Glazer have, uh, have written sort of uh, written on famously, that same engine drives attractive jobs in advertising, takes some of our most uh, so smartest people who then sell the dream of endless consumption that people wittingly or unwittingly, but willingly in any case buy, shell out money on for completely ridiculous things that don't add to our happiness, but that increase our energy consumption massively. And that are then paid for, the price of those is paid for elsewhere. There's no other way and the, the, that's when we come to the donut and to the limits of growth and uh, <laughs> those things don't, uh, don't sell as well in advertising campaigns. I mean, the, the campaigns, that, the ads I think are the most brilliant when we go to the cinema, here we are back at the films and I know that this is something we share. Um, our, our, the ad by Kiwi Supermarket, right? The one with these two guys spaced off on a bridge saying, I'm not going to move, I'll read a book all day. Uh, totally individualistic, me first, right? And it's celebrated and it's made attractive. I love that ad, it's brilliant. And the other, any ad by Tilia, they, they just sell you this thing that is emotionally powerful because the people who are the best paid in that industry get those jobs to make that something that we talk about here. They're incredibly successful and they are morally culpable for making us a society that lives well beyond its means. And like you said, in the Norwegian context, that's uh, going to come back to bite us if we don't switch fast. Mm. The question is, is this for the city? I would doubt that. So I don't think that it's difficult behavior. to disentangle. Yeah, of course it is, right? Therefore, we have research <laughs> on that and we're, we'll be uh, busy with that. I, I don't agree. I don't agree that that's because of uh, research or the lack of it. I think it's... Uh, it's a bias that's inherent to metrics, to how we can measure things. There are things we can measure, things we can't measure as easily, mm -hmm. and those lend themselves to being marginalized in any kind of economic analysis of value. And those are the things that are basically linked with externality, spatially, environmental, uh, environmentally, that are borne by people who are also the most vulnerable, as opposed to cities, which have the people who lead things, who make decisions, who you know, steer stuff. So it's an example of leadership without diversity because it's looking at the urban form as concentrating wealth, power, and uh, creativity. extraction. Creativity, that's the essential. At the service of what? And, and we already see here how bringing together four people, uh, just having them in a relaxed atmosphere can give you a lot of food for thought in, in, a, in, in a conversation that we just had now. And we won't finish this conversation here because this is a conversation that is ongoing. As you've seen, there's, there's questions that, that are open. Uh, that's why we have research that is going on. Uh, and this is why we're so happy to have the four of you here, uh, Tom, Sid, Martin, and Luna, who could share with us some of the insights that you gain through your work uh, and I would like to thank you very much for, for joining us uh, this evening. And uh, I think many of those who, who tuned in uh, have uh, enjoyed being with us here uh, this evening. Um, to you all out there, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, however, of course, you are very welcome to tune in tomorrow for the third day of the 2021 Pint of Science uh, from Stavanger, Norway with our program Till Death Do Us Part and uh, might be a bit uh, dark on the outside but uh, tune in and uh, get surprised what we have in store for you see you tomorrow thank you <laughs>